Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Doorstep Book Talks. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vosdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie. Today, very excited to welcome John Clifton um, from Gallup about his new book, Blind Spot, The Global Rise of Unhappiness and How Leaders Missed It. My well-read copy. I have lots of questions for you, and we welcome audience questions as well. Um, this book, I don't know, might be my favorite book of the year, John, because it really captures what I think people need to be talking more about. Local sentiment, what people are thinking, what people are feeling, how people are living their lives. I mean, boom, period. I think that is what as you point out in this book, um, global leaders are missing, uh, CEOs are missing. Um, hopefully you you are implementing all of your recommendations in the book at your company, John. <laughs> and I'll have to review your uh, book with your colleagues at Gallup. Um, but today here, uh, we wanna share with our audience um, some of the findings from your book um, and some of the recommendations, because I think this is also what makes your book um, a little bit different, is there are actually action items we can take away uh, today and, and go forward. Um, in terms of uh, the biggest takeaway for me, um, and, and I think this will speak to a lot of people uh, in, in our audience too, is that the top 20% of the world could hardly be doing better, and the top 20 the bottom half of the world, the bottom 20% could hardly be doing worse. I think that quote really encapsulated this book um, and encapsulate, encapsulates what's going on um, globally today. Um, I love the global nature of this book and, and how we're not just going to be talking about the US here today. We're, we're really talking about how this effort spans the world. And here at the doorstep, that's what we try to do. We try to look at the world and the impact um, here at home. Um, so on so many levels, this book is so important and really should be in everybody's uh, holiday stocking this year. Um, can you share with us kind of the genesis of this book and your goals um, for it um, as a way to start off the conversation? Absolutely. And first, Nick, Tatiana, thank you for having me. It means a lot to us at Gallup that you're helping us give a voice to the world in terms of how everyone feels. Um, we started doing this work about 15 years ago. And when I say this work, we started capturing and quantifying how the entire world feels. Why? Because leaders everywhere have done an incredible job in terms of quantifying whether or not their economies are growing or contracting. They've done an incredible job figuring out whether or not the labor force is growing or getting smaller. But what they're not doing a very good job on is capturing at a large scale how people feel. And we think that's a problem. Um, and the reason we think it's a problem is because the way people feel is often what determines how they act. And right now, people don't feel very well. The reason for that is because we wanted to know how much stress is in the world, how much anger, how much pain. And so we started capturing that by just going out into people's homes um, in about 40 countries, we call people, but in the other 100 countries, we show up at their house and we sit in for a very long conversation, ask them, um, tell us about whether or not you have a lot of stress, whether or not you have a lot of anger, whether or not you experience a lot of worry. And what we found is that over the past 10 years, all of those negative emotions have had a steady rise and it has this very concern, which is why we wrote this book because we wanted to tell the world that this rise of misery did not start with the pandemic. It started eight years before. And so while the pandemic collectively made us miserable, it exacerbated an already rising problem. I think that point is so important and tells a lot about how people also are uh, and make their voice heard to leaders um, in politics. And I think you have some very telling examples in the book. Uh, you lead off with an example in Tunisia uh, and uh, the Arab Spring. Um, could you kind of walk us through that as a, as a lens into how what people are feeling really does impact, you know, protesting and governments, et cetera? You know, there's a story that goes around here in Washington. That I, I wonder if it's even true, but apparently uh, President Obama actually said to James Clapper, why is it that we spend a, that we spend billions of dollars on intelligence? But no one could have told me that the Arab Spring was coming. 
Um, and whether or not the story is true, it creates an interesting question. Why did we miss it? With all the intelligence that we have, with the satellite imagery that we have on every single country, we uh, yeah, what we've learned from uh, at least Edward Snowden and a number of others is that America reads the emails uh, of many world leaders. So we know what's happening in terms of leader to leader dialogue. We know what's happening in terms of satellite imagery, and we know what all economic indicators look like. So why is it that we don't fully understand what's happening within countries? And I think one of the single biggest gaps is that we're not capturing how people feel on uh, sort of a large scale basis. And it took place in Tunisia. You know, if you look back at the Human Development Index, which is to tell us whether or not a, a country is developing, and they use three indicators. They use income, they use education, and they use life expectancy. All those things showed perfect progress over a five-year period of time. But when we asked people how their lives are going, it was crashing. What was the disconnect? Because if everything objectively told us that things were going well, yet people, their own subjective uh, will or intent told us something very differently. Um, why is it that we had so little curiosity about how people felt when all we wanted to do is rely on these traditional economic indicators? So I think there's a massive opportunity for uh, leaders everywhere in order to, uh, you know, not just maybe from an intel perspective, but also from a how do we make people's lives better perspective? Um, because how human beings feel hugely matters in terms of how their lives are going. And we see it's getting worse. I'm really struck by that because it is, it's true that governments, intelligence analysts, and others really focus on these concrete economic indicators, in part because they're quantifiable in a way that's easy. And we can say your GDP has grown, your GDP per capita has shrunk, uh, national income is up, uh, infant mortality is down. But I think it really your your point here about not then translating as to how 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 do people experience and understand what's happening uh, in their lives, and we see that I think you know in our own context where we have this puzzlement about uh, degree of prosperity in the United States, and yet uh, these feelings of disconnection, these feelings of anger, uh, the fact that you know the 2016 and 2020 elections. Uh, didn't necessarily go the way that the economic indicators, or 2022 elections for that matter, the way that the economic indicators uh, might have pointed for that, uh, that, you know, when we look at the uh, backgrounds of some of the people involved in January 6th, we're not looking at dispossessed, you know, dispossessed landless farmers and proletariat. We're looking at people who, by all indications, are living comfortable middle, upper middle class lifestyles uh, with you know, second homes and boats and expensive cars. And yet, you know, this this sense of anger uh, or this sense of malaise or this sense of frustration. And what you said, I think, uh, and what really struck me then is kind of the, the dating point, right? You said, we're looking at something that, you know, eight years or so before the pandemic. And I've heard others really say that between 2012 and 2014, there does seem to be some inflection point, something happens uh, that we begin to see the, the anger building up, the misery index going up, uh, that's disconnected from economic performance. Um, in, in identifying this and doing this project, what is your sense then maybe of what is the, you know, what happened in the 2010s? Is this a hangover of the global economic crisis? Is this uh, you know, Instagram, I mean, that, that the argument has been that this jump in teen suicide starts after Instagram uh, is released. I mean, do we have a sense of what might be driving this? If it's, it's not hard. economics. <laughs> Let me start with the social media question, because that is a question that a lot of people have, especially when you look at what we call uh, the widening, uh, in, excuse me, the widening uh, gap of well-being inequality, which is when we ask people to rate their lives on a scale of zero to 10 and 10 is the best possible life, zero is the worst possible life, where do you stand today? And so 15 years ago, we found that it was roughly three and a half percent of people said, my life is perfect. I have a 10. And there was about one and a half that said, my life is the worst possible life. It can't get any worse. Fast forward to today and the percent of people who say my life is a perfect 10 has more than doubled. It's now 8%. And the percent of people who say my life can't get any worse um, has more than quadrupled. It too is wow. at about 8%. Uh, 
Um, so it's again, you're seeing this widening uh, inequality of well-being that's taking place. And if you uh, look at the top quintile and the lower quintile, uh, it's even more pronounced. And so one thing would be to lay this on social media and say, well, that's, of course, at the exact same time as when social media is taken up. There's, it's hard for us to definitively answer that question because we are not asking about social media behavior, whether or not people are using it frequently. But what we are asking is access to the Internet. And we can see that negative emotions, anger, stress, sadness, physical pain and worry are rising for people who are online, but for the 30% of people who are not online, it's rising for them too. So that would be at least a data point that would suggest that let's not overly blame social media for this one particular cause, only because there's one third of humanity that's not linked into social media and they're seeing a lot more pain in their daily lives. So the question then becomes, well, what do you think it is? And again, all we can do is look to see what we see in our data and if there are any other connections that we can make. So, uh, you know, we are asking others to look at this information and draw and invite them to draw any conclusions of their own. Um, but three things really stand out. Number one is the global rise of hunger. So while the, war went, uh, while the world has been winning the war on hunger for four decades, we started to lose in 2014 and the rise of moderate to severe uh, hunger has been rising since 2014, and we work on that with FAO, and it's been a really concerning trend. So people are getting hungrier, and it's not just moderate food insecurity, it's severe food insecurity, which is arguably the worst kind, uh, one step before debilitating hunger that leads to death. Um, the other two are work uh, workplaces. Right now, workplaces continue to be completely miserable. We find of those that actually have jobs, um, only 20% of them are thriving at work, which means 80% aren't. And 20% of the workforce is completely miserable. Every single minute they spend at work makes their life worse. In fact, when we compare the anger, stress, sadness, physical pain, and worry of those workers compared to those who have no work whatsoever, the unemployed, they're the same. If anything, the people who are totally miserable at work, their daily pain is slightly worse than those that are unemployed. I think it's one of the most significant findings that we've had in Gallup's global tracking history. That pain is very real and it's hardly getting better. And at least in the U.S., we've seen it get worse uh, since the start of the pandemic. And the last back aspect is loneliness. You know, you can see in the OECD countries, there is a commitment to understanding loneliness, to understanding loneliness's impact on the rise of suicides but it's underappreciated globally. And so in many countries, if you say, what percent of people live in debilitating loneliness in countries like Tanzania or in countries like Peru, the data don't exist and that's a problem. So it's one of the things that we are working toward is to create the world's official statistics for loneliness so we can have a better understanding of what percent of the people are truly suffering uh, from this massive societal issue. Yeah, and I'd like to frame this because this fits in nicely with how you are exploring these issues. Um, and when you're looking at what well-being overall, um, you know, well-being equated to happiness, it's really five areas. And the the way that your the book is broken up is into these five areas. And I do want to focus um, on the areas you mentioned, the loneliness and uh, the three areas you mentioned: loneliness, food, insecurity, um, and work. And starting with work, though, because um, it's it's not just about, as you write in the book, about kind of the you know the rising um, unsatisfaction with work. It's also, you write about the global jobs crisis. It's about the quality of the jobs that people are, are having. And I want to relate this. This is very real. I, I shared your book with my um, politics class uh, where I teach. And, and all of the students said they were unhappy. So, you know, mm. you have a real world um, uh, feedback on your book. All of them are unhappy. And I said, why? And they did mention the jobs. They are None of my students expect to get a job with their degree um and you know and then we can go into your second which is financial because you know all of them are also experiencing huge student debt and you know which is going to impact them as you as you write even if you pay off your debt that lingering mental effect of having the debt in the first place is going to impact your life um and so the how do we and and this is maybe where we can start going into recommendations so that we do have some positives along with with some of this um data that we're getting that that can feel overwhelming <laughs> um yeah. how do we create 
you know, and or a focus on the quality of jobs, because Nick, you mentioned that the data, you know, oh, we have this data that tells us what's real. And actually, John, I really liked your discussion that employment data is flawed. You know, you know, how many people are unemployed at any given time is related to all different sorts of factors. And it might not be the way we should be looking at data in the first place. Um, so, so how can we create, you know, better jobs data um, and encourage governments, encourage CEOs to to work towards that aspect? Because, as you say in the book, we spend 13 years plus of our lives at work. Yeah, and forgive me for this, but I, if if you don't mind, Nick, I was answering your question. There's one thing that I wanted to oh, make please. sure I mention, which is when we think about well, what's happened over the past 10 years. So. As a human being, if you start to have no hope for a great job, you mix that in with hunger within societies. Because remember, even a place like the United States, the U.S. has millions of people who are still part of the SNAP program or food stamps, which they've been traditionally uh, referred to. When you mix those in with the perception that you can't get ahead and you feel like the system is working against you. So one of the questions that we ask in as many countries as possible is, do you think corruption is widespread in your government? And the other question that we ask is, do you think corruption is widespread in the businesses in your country? And the way that those numbers continue to hover above 70% wow. shows that people are have this growing frustration where they don't feel like anything is going to improve for them and they feel like the systems are working against them. And it doesn't have to be this way. There are countries where very few percentages of people are saying that they think corruption is widespread in their businesses or in their government. Uh, but too many feel this way. And I think that's what one of the concerns is. Can you, uh, can so, you, sorry, John, can you just yeah. maybe give us a sense of, you know, I think sometimes listeners say, of course, I expect that to, to get those answers in, uh, in, in Uganda or Bangladesh or Peru, but can you give us a sense of what the U.S. numbers are when well, Americans so the, are asked that? <laughs> let, let, let's give two examples, the United States and Germany. So in the United States, well, in both countries, if you look at our data about 15 years ago, they were almost the same. It was about 55 percent uh, of people in both countries said that they felt that corruption was widespread in their government. That number started to rise dramatically in the United States, and now it's hung at about 75% for a very long time. Whereas in Germany, at least up until about the past two years, it dropped significantly. A lot, uh, uh, way fewer Germans were saying that they thought that corruption was widespread. The point is, is it's possible uh, where it doesn't have to be that way. Because I agree with you, there are a lot that look at that information and they go, Everybody thinks corruption is widespread in their government. Everybody thinks it's widespread in businesses. It's not true. It doesn't always have to be that way. And we've seen times in our database where that wasn't the case. Um, so can we get back to um, Bob's? <laughs> the, the going back to the bro our broken workplaces, yeah. um, because I do think that, you know, where uh, where people feel the most pain is where they spend the most time, as you point out in your in your book. And um, some uh, some things that we can do to to work on these issues and to get better data, um, so that we're not looking at this weird number of here in the U.S., for example. Oh, it's a, there's a low unemployment rate. You know, you can find there's help wanted signs everywhere, but they're not the great jobs that we want to be working at. It's a great point. And the unemployment number, it's not to say that it is a terrible number. And the unemployment figure that so many labor force surveys produce is probably a quite reliable figure for wealthy countries. But one of the places that it doesn't serve its constituents well is in poorer countries. So if you look anywhere, and you can just Google this as an activity now, Google the countries that have the lowest unemployment rates in the world. On that list, you'll see some of the poorest countries in the world. Why? Um, it's because that so many people are wrongfully categorized as self-employed. There are people who might be selling trinkets on the street. They could be a subsistence farmer. They're doing it out of necessity, not out of opportunity. And in the West, we confuse and conflate these terms of entrepreneurship and self-employment. When we hear self-employment, we think, man, that's going to be the next creator of a huge multi-billion dollar organization. Or we think it's somebody that's demonstrating pride that they've opened up a restaurant down the street and they're going to be their own boss. And that's amazing. 
That reality is not always true in many other countries. And the statistics, quite frankly, the statistics go too hard in terms of the percent of people. So you can see very clearly that many of them are self-employed and also a majority of them live on less than $2 a day. That's a problem. Again, it's why places like Cuba have the top 15 lowest unemployment rates in the world or places like Burundi. Um, so a fix to that is rather than say to governments around the world, hey, let's work to the lowest common denominator of work where we should reduce the amount of people who say they have no work whatsoever and want work, which is what unemployment is. And instead, let's see what percent of great jobs we can create. And again, this is a suggestion. And you know, right now, what I recommend in the book, I'm very open about this too, that it may not be perfect. So if there are others that think we should add components to it, let's do it. But today, what a good job or great job looks like is steady work, a paycheck, and the subjective attitudes that you have the ability to do what you do best, that you have colleagues that you enjoy working with. Uh, that you have the development opportunities you need in order to learn and grow every single day, and that you get the recognition that you deserve for doing great work. These fundamental, I guess you could call them Maslow's hierarchy of needs at work, are just non-existent, and they need to be far more present. And that is what we could contribute to creating the world's official statistics for great jobs. Um yeah, that, that would just really resonated um, with me as, you know, studying um, workplace environments um, and also the connection that you make with financial well-being. Um, and I'd like to, you know, it, before we get into our other areas, um, I'd like for you to explain to our audience um, how you look at the questions of how you see life and how you live your life. Because I do think those are two separate but very important concepts in the book that you say over and over again. And I had to keep reading it to understand what they meant. And so mm -hmm. um, for our readers, you know, the questions aren't just being asked on a scale of one to 10, but it's, there, there's a difference between how you see things and how you live them. And can you talk more about that? And why Absolutely. You that's a fantastic question because measuring how someone uh, someone's well-being is as complicated and nuanced as understanding whether or not a an economy is growing or contracting. Of course, when we think of GDP, there are multiple components on government spending. How big is the consumer-based economy? And similarly, when we're looking at people's lives, we have to measure different components. So the way that we do this is we start with a definition and we define subjective well-being as how someone sees their life and how someone lives their life. Now, this is two very different constructs and much of it is rooting in, rooted in Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman's work, uh, who is, of course, known as the father of behavioral economics, because how you remember life is very different than how you experience life. And so we're trying to capture both concepts. So the way that we get at how you see your life is we ask people to rate their lives on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is the best possible life and zero is the worst possible life. Where, life, where do you stand today? Now, when we rank those countries, the countries who rate their lives the highest are often the richest. That's why when you hear the world's happiest countries, the use of the word happy may be a misnomer. Because what you're probably looking at is the country, uh, the countries where people are the most content. And it's why places like Denmark, Finland, and Sweden are often number one on that list. And the countries at the bottom are places like Haiti, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Afghanistan. They rate their lives the absolute worst in the world. Now, on the other side of the ledger is how people experience life. That's whether or not they have a lot of stress every day whether or not they have a lot of sadness. It's also whether or not they laugh and smile a lot or whether or not they have a great deal of intellectual stimulation, which we've attempted to capture through asking people whether or not they learned or did something interesting the day before the interview. And when we look at the results of that, they're very different than how people see their lives. So the part of the world that experiences the most negative emotions, it's been true every single year in the 15 to 16 years that we've been tracking this, which is the Middle East. Uh, Iran and Iraq have almost always been number one and number two on that particular list. Um, and on the other side of that ledger, which is positive emotions, whether or not people laugh and smile a lot, experience a lot of enjoyment, whether or not they feel well rested or treated with respect, the region of the world that dominates that 
which has been true for 16 straight years, is Latin America. You could argue that no one in the world knows how to have more fun than Latin Americans. So that's what the measurements look like and why they're different. So when people approach us and they go, I need a definitive list on who the happiest people in the world are. Our question is always back to them. Well, that depends on how you define happiness, because if you define it through contentment, then yes, indeed, Danes, Finns, and Swedes are the happiest people in the world. Um, but as you notice in the book, when that, when that gets launched, it's Gallup's data that are used in the World Happiness Report. It's very confusing to many people in those countries. In fact, one official actually said after the results, um, somebody said, what's it like to be a minister in uh, the government of the country that's happiest in the world? And he said, if we're the happiest country in the world, I'd hate to see the other countries. And the joke's funny because it's true. They don't see themselves as happy, but I don't think any of them are, would argue the fact that they're very content. Um, so again, if you define happiness as contentment, then it's the Nordic countries. But if you define happiness as experiences of joy um, and laughter, then it is without question Latin America where people are the happiest. That just reminds me of an anecdote that a Finn once told me about how in Finland they think Russians are too happy. Uh, that, you know, that compared to, and you're thinking exactly, and I think that really hits at this point of contentment versus experience of, of positive emotions and, and the like. And, uh, you know, that also then has, you know, policy implications, I think, because you do have, uh, you know, you've seen it in, in, in a number of U.S. circles of we should, you know, we should be more like the Scandinavians, whether it's in education policy or in employment policy, uh, because this will make us happier, uh, or it will make citizens happier. But I think this is a great point to you know to to, to throw out that you know contentment versus happiness is defined as pos exper continuous experience of positive emotions, laughter, and joy uh, are separate things, and that may lead to very different uh, uh, policy outcomes and recommendations. So, I, I think that is a great launching point in, into your third area, which is kind of community, right? Um, speaking of policies, um, you mentioned, um, you know, the rise in, in loneliness, um, you know, how people feel about their communities, community, you know, looking at more at community indexes. Um, and I, I want to speak more about that, especially because there were a couple of countries you mentioned in the book that have uh, created ministries of loneliness to kind of tackle this issue, and and I know that you know we you know the pandemic exacerbated discussions that people were more lonely, but but you've actually seen the trend over time that the breakdown in communities, which you know to your point, Nick, let's you know what policies do governments or do corporations need to create to create better community vibes so that. You know, they're countering loneliness. Um, so can you speak to maybe some of the things that you learned in the survey or in looking at some of these ministries of loneliness, some things that they're doing to help on that community angle? Well, there are two things, right? I mean, so one of the biggest drivers is social well-being and the other one is community well-being. And they're both incredibly important. And so from a social well-being perspective, uh, it is a basic human need that you need social interaction. And we find when in conducting these surveys that when we ask people over the past two weeks, how many people did you spend meaningful time with? You know, we had people say to us 150. We had people say to us 100. I and mean, they're really popular people that we spoke with. We also had people say zero. In fact, one individual in Canada that we spoke with uh, randomly called him on his mobile phone and asked him about how his life is going. At the end of the survey, we said to him, and when was your or how old are you? And, you know, he said, it's funny that you asked me my age because today's my birthday and you're the only person I've spoken to all day. And it's because he experiences debilitating loneliness. He doesn't have anyone that reaches out to him to ask him how his day is going. And that's a problem. And 6% of the entire world live a life just like him. And it's not just about whether or not you have, uh, you know, quality friends or, or excuse me, it's not your quantity of friends. It's also your quality. And we asked people about whether or not they had someone that they could rely on in times of need. And we find that it's 20% consistently don't have anyone they could count on in a time of need. And that's a problem. And you are correct that your community could be some of those individuals that could help you in a time of need. And what we find is that what makes a great community is not just providing the basics. So we find that a third of people everywhere, especially women, 
don't feel physically secure in their communities. And that's a problem. Um, and so it's not just making sure people feel safe. It's also about whether or not they have the fundamental basics, basics like education. But even then, even if those are there, you also need people who help each other out. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of that's not taking place. People who give back financially, people who give back their time. And the big one is whether or not they just help strangers. And much of that's absent around the world. But there still are bright spots. So one of the places that I highlight in blind spot is the Gambia, because the Gambia is one of the poorest countries in the world. But when we ask them about whether or not they've given money to an organization, whether or not they've donated their time to an organization or helped a stranger, they're one of the top 10 countries in the world. So although some of the building blocks of a great community are not there because the basics aren't there, like feeling safe or whether or not they have, you know, the roads and infrastructure, the other building blocks are there because they have the people that make great communities. Um, and so there's a lot that the world can learn from a place like the Gambia. Um, I, in terms of community too, you mentioned cultural differences in some of the research. And you mentioned that in um, Asian countries, there is more of that community as aspect because they are, uh, they, there is more collectivist thinking, more, uh, you know, you, you can rely more on your neighbor. Um, can you talk to how cultural differences come into play when you're asking these questions. And and I was like, I mean, you do interviews in over 140 countries in, in I mean, over 80 languages. Like, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So culture is a big topic for doing this because one of the things you'll notice that we don't ask, and this is more of a linguistic issue that, than cultural, but of course, culture and language uh, have a, a lot to do with each other. Um, we actually don't anywhere ask about the word happy. We don't ask people if they're happy. We don't ask if they experience a lot of happiness. And the reason for that is, is we've really struggled to be able to find a way that you can come up with words that convey the same concept in so many different languages and dialects. So it's just not possible. Love is another one. I don't mean to sound like a bumper sticker, but love is hard to translate. And so the way that we conduct the surveys, we started asking about whether or not people had experienced a lot of love the previous day of the interview. Now, that question may uh, cause a lot of people in the United States to think about whether or not they were called by their mom or their dad or their spouse or their kids and told, you know, said, I love you, et cetera. But the challenge is, is that in a lot of cultures, that meant a physical aspect. And so you can ask anything you want in survey research, but it doesn't mean that what you're comparing are apples to oranges. And we experienced it with that. And so it was an expensive mistake, if you will, but it's also something that allows us to learn a lot from this particular information. Um, and the last one I would say, there are a lot of people that just sort of explain the results of our surveys using culture. And I think that's a mistake. So a lot of times when we say, uh, in Latin America, people are the most likely to express that they've experienced a lot of joy uh, or laugh and smile a lot. And they'll say, well, that's a cultural thing, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe it is and maybe it's not. But whatever the case is, there's a lot that the rest of the world can learn from Latin America so that all of us could enjoy, uh, experience the same kind of joy that they do at the frequency that they do. And I think it's pretty remarkable um, that this survey is able to uncover that. The last thing I would say is a lot of times people say that in East Asian societies, that when we find that scores are lower than what you might expect, again, they hang it on culture and say that many are not as expressive about their anger, or their stress or their joy. And if that's true, then why does it change? And I say that because we do see in some countries, for example, in China, where anger, stress, sadness, physical pain and worry has been rising for the last couple of years. And so if we had written it off as a cultural thing that why these were superficially low, um, or again, as the assumption would be that they're uh, low based on culture, then how do you explain the recent rise? Um, and I think that's I think that's something that we all need to focus on a little bit more. And again, why I think this has been in a blind spot for so many, because they write this off for the wrong kind of reasons. Yeah, and just let's stick with China for a second. I, I think they, you know, uh, the protests there, I think, 
I think my hypothesis show exactly what you're saying, um, that there is this discontentment and, uh, you know, and that it is more than just pandemic restrictions. It is, you know, a rising feeling related to all the topics we've discussed today, jobs, you know, loneliness, isolation, uh, and coming out and, and protesting in a society that is not known for, you know, allowing freedom of, of speech and expression in that way. Um, and so I do think that is also why it's really important to to look at sentiment. Um, we have one comment in the in the uh, chat from Stephen Young, but we welcome all of our audience to send in your questions, send in your comments. Um, you know, the point here is elite listens to itself, not to people. Um, I'm not sure we can comment on that, but I do think there the sense and I, I get from the book is that we do need to take sentiment from people um, on the ground. Um, you also uh, recommend in the book to get hyperlocal, not just to look at the United States, but to break up the United States into into regions, into states, because there's a huge yeah. difference by state, uh, which I thought was was interesting. What are some of your state by state, uh, maybe for our audience uh, comparisons? Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you do, if, if we treat countries like a monolith, I think one of the challenges is, is that it masks over massive differences that are taking place at the regional level. For example, if you were to break out every U.S. state uh, and rank it by how people rate their lives on a scale of zero to 10, uh, how the U.S. would rank globally changes a lot to the point where Utah would come out around number seven and West Virginia would end up being somewhere around 60th. And it's because uh, the realities of what's happening in Utah compared to West Virginia, there are massive, massive differences. Um, but the same is true, not just within U.S. states, but they're also true within provinces, regions, states, cantons, if we're going to Switzerland. Um, but if we could break out places like Uttar Pradesh, imagine what we could learn in India, uh, looking at every single region with the frequency that we look at things like employment or GDP rates. And you brought up China and the protests that now so many of us are aware of right now. But the question is, what takes place before people go to the streets? And I think it's interesting, Noah Yuval Hariri in Homo Deus talks about how the human mind is like an algorithm. But what is put into that algorithm where the output is the anger and frustration that causes us to actually go to the streets? And as you mentioned, as you hear, I'm, I mentioned anger, frustration. How do we capture those things? And can you through survey research? Right now, we believe that we can and that we're collecting meaningful information because right now in terms of face validation, if you will, we can see that the trends are meaningful. Um, do they fully explain everything that's happening in the world? Definitely not. Um, but are they potentially explaining some things? A few academics believe so. Um, George Ward, for example, used Gallup's data and also sentiment from Twitter uh, and other social media platforms to see if he actually could predict the uh, either outcome of elections or if he could predict the rise in populist sentiment or the rise in populist parties. And he believes that he can. And again, depending on who you determine is populist. Um, and again, sometimes people believe that there are populists on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but, you know, you could see in places like in Brazil, like in Mexico, a steady rise in negative emotions over the past decade. Um, and so, you know, did that contribute to the rise of Jair Bolsonaro? Did it contribute to the rise of AMLO in Mexico? Uh, we can't say uh, definitively that it did, but you can see this underlying frustration uh, that was taking place in many of these countries. Uh, and I don't think it's too far of a stretch that you can draw a parallel to how people feel and what they do, not just in the streets, but also in the ballot box. You know, listening to that and, and you know, just as, as this conversation is continuing, uh, I'm really struck by a you know, the points that you're raising with with a text I had to read, uh, in, you know, as a student in, 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 a, in a history class, uh, which was a, a book called They Thought They Were Free. It was a series based on a series of massive amounts of interviews that were done uh, after the war in Germany. Uh, and it was trying to get at, you know, the, the, the rise of, of the Nazi movement, but also kind of popular 
reactions and acquiescence. And and just as as you're going through all of these things, you know, these themes that in this book, in these interviews of people saying, "I didn't think I had a future. Uh, there was no work. Uh, jobs weren't going to be available. Uh, I was lonely." Um, you know, the, the Nazi movement, I joined and supported it because it gave me community, it broke down class barriers, it, it, it opened up opportunities, I felt valued. Uh, obviously, you know, th some people in Germany were not valued by the movement, and that was also part of that commu negative community building, right? It, it took the anger and frustration and it focused it on, on specific targets. But it does seem that, you know, everything that you're laying out here um, you know, this this kind of thing, well, democracy will solve all of this. And, and you know, the president has laid this out in the national security strategy. Uh, but as you're saying here, that we can also look at this and say, maybe this charts the rise of political movements and uh, that may not be, uh, you know, democratically inclined. And, you know, if we see enough of these factors in play, does that then suggest uh, these types of more authoritarian, whether left or right, authoritarian populist movements gaining traction precisely because they're going to promise to people community, jobs, uh, a future, we're going to give you hope again, um, you know, versus if democracy doesn't seem to fulfill those things, uh, then, you know, people will turn away from those, from those democratic movements. And Tatiana, back to your students, you know, saying, you know, not happy, a uh, concern about the future. I would have to think that that is directly linked to the polling data that says, you know, support and, and belief in the efficacy of democracy uh, declines as you go younger, that younger generations in the United States are less inclined to uh, to say that the democratic system can, can meet these needs. So again, just listening to this, I'm just struck by hearing these parallels and um, you know, and then some of these concerns uh, about whether or not, from our perspective in the U.S., you know, maybe we're not out of the woods in terms of, uh, you know, beating back a, a proto-authoritarian challenge to our system. You know, I think another aspect of this is purpose. And there are a number of, I, I think, scholars and thinkers that talk about the human mind has a need for purpose following, um, you know, some kind of religion. I don't necessarily mean religion as, uh, you know, a, a monotheist or a polytheist, but a religion in terms of whatever it is that they prescribe to, even if it's democracy, socialism, communism. And I think one of the questions is, is that if you are struggling within your life and can't really find anything to attach yourself to, to say, what is it that I'm going to be following and be passionate about. Um, I think this is one of the reasons that there are a number of individuals that are they're that struggling in life and reflecting it. It's hard for us to capture that kind of information. Yeah. Um, but to your point on why are there so many young people here in the United States that are sort of um, sort of emotionally detaching from concepts like democracy, which you can see very clearly in the data uh, that that may have more negative consequences for society because what else are they attaching to? But also, yeah. uh, do they not actually have anything? And I think this is one of the challenges in organizations too, because what's helpful is when we connect people to the mission of the organization. What's the organization trying to accomplish outside of making money? This is why I think so many young people are creating pressures within companies to say, we've got to stand for more than what Milton Friedman said a company stands for in 1970. Do we really only stand for making money? And it's not to say that we are going to have a world of nonprofits, because, of course, the owners of these companies, which are not just um, rich people, a lot of times they're pensions, they could be, um, you know, government owned entities. Uh, and they're making investments in these places and they're saying, look, we need to increase the retirement fund for the, or the people within this organization. But I think, again, uh, this is why you see these pressures now, even from the investor side, things like ESG, where they're yeah. saying, hey, can we look to more of a purpose and a mission behind this organization outside of just making money, although that needs to be a part of it, too? Um, I, I have two two questions that are totally unrelated. I don't know which direction I want to go, but since I'll stick with the politics one, because I thought this was really interesting um, that you asked 
uh, your survey, uh, one with the politics questions in the front and one, one without, and you find that people answer differently when they don't see the politics question first, uh, and you write, the toxic nature of partisan politics can actually make people feel worse about their lives. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. So we, again, this, you could call this a mistake. You could call it an error or you could call it an incredible discovery. I like to think of it as that. Um, in 2008, Gallup was tracking the presidential election of uh, Barack Obama and John McCain. And we were asking after who are you going to vote for? What polling station do you typically go, go to? And we do that because we're trying to figure out if we can predict whether or not they're going to vote. Um, and of course, you know, these likely voter models are key in order to predict the outcome of the election. So we had this very robust module of questions to ask them about their participation in voting, who they're going to vote for, et cetera. At the very end, we would say, rate your life on a scale of zero to 10. And at the very end of the election, we took the election questions off and then we just went back to rate your life on a scale of zero to 10. And we noticed people started to rate their lives better and we couldn't figure it out. And so our chief workplace scientist, Jim Harder, and now Nobra Laureate, Angus Deaton, were looking at the data and they said, you know what? I don't think this was a massive increase just because Obama won, which uh, we have seen some increases because of that. And that's a separate thing I'm happy to discuss. Um, but what it was is this sort of context effect that if you prime someone to think about something, it causes them to think differently about other things. It's a thing that we've known about in psychology for a very long time, and now behavioral economists have talked about it at length. Um, but the priming we did was politics, and then we asked people about their lives. And what we found was, if you prime someone with politics, they feel worse. And that sort of shows us that there is a general toxicity of politics, that the very dialogue of it um, upsets us. Now, it may not be true of everyone, but at least we could see it in a national survey with the United States. And before we say that we should never deal with politics again, and isn't this a point for authoritarian regimes who don't have to deal with politics? Um, I think it requires further study, but it goes to show that not everyone is down to talk about politics on Thanksgiving. Um, and the very mention of it might worsen people's mood. So be careful about who and when you talk about it. Yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting. I also thought, and I have I have to mention this, that there was no gender difference in the in the life questions, which you know, that was in the back of my mind as I was reading, and then and then you did address it at the end. Why is why do you think that men and women are responding the same to these questions? <laughs> I, I I that was that was completely shocking to me. So there was a conference we had a long time ago where when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she kindly came to Gallup. We partnered with the World Bank to announce that the world needs more data on gender, um, because a lot of times when you're doing household surveys, you can't really do great gender disaggregation because you're asking the head of the household um, to speak on behalf of everyone. So the data aren't great. And in Gallup surveys, it's not the case. We do individual level surveys. And of course, the question we ask is rate your life on a scale of zero to 10. And so considering that we can see very clearly in our data that women do not have the same opportunities as men in the workplace and that women do not have the same physical security that men do. Uh, in fact, it's one of the largest uh, gender gaps that we see in our entire database about whether or not they feel safe in their communities. One would reasonably conclude that women would rate their lives worse, especially considering those two things are among the biggest drivers. So it's very surprising to us that we find uh, that not only do women rate their lives exactly the same as men in every single country in the world, um, if anything, they rate their lives slightly higher. The pattern is true globally, the pattern is true regionally, and the pattern is true in every individual country for every single year of our tracking. So. The reason I put it in the section on we still do cannot speak to this definitively is because that's true. We don't have an answer or can explain this. Um, I went in and interviewed um, at least four of what I believe are the best experts on women's well-being globally. Like, for example, uh, Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders, who was America's ambassador to 
uh, Nigeria and the Congo. She's already written. She's also written a book on the Uli women. Um, mm. And so she had a very unique perspective, uh, which was uh, women don't compare their lives to men. So this is not even an appropriate analysis, which I thought was uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, Carol Graham, who originally wrote a white paper on this, and she said, I had no idea that this publication would be the most read publication in my career, but it is. Uh, and she titled it, Women Are Happier Than Men. Um, and she said the reason for this is because women expect that they should have equal rights to men in many cases. And when they are given to women, you do not necessarily see a massive increase in how they see their lives because they had already expected those things. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, you can see it almost drop um, because they feel like they're still behind in some uh, aspects of society when those rights uh, can be given. So um, that's why I think it's, it's really interesting from the uh, perspective of these experts as to why this is happening. But since the publication of this book, this goes to show you how fast this research is um, moving. But there is uh, a researcher that put forward a paper and she said the reason this is happening is because women's expectations are different. And she can see it by using um, this sort of technique that we call vignettes. So we ask respondents to, if there's a man that's 50, he's rich, he lives in Denmark, where do you think he should uh, rate his life? And she says that women are rating that lower because their expectations are different. And thus, if you adjust for it, you do actually see that women rate their lives lower than men globally. So again, this is very fascinating from a behavioral and a psychology perspective. Um, and if we can continue to get more brilliant minds like her to help us advance this information, I think it'll put us in a place where we can truly perfect these indicators for the world. So, so what's next? Speaking of what's next, what do we need to do today to, to make changes? If, if, if we were in a perfect world, and I guess money were no issue, uh, we would be able to have indicators on anger, stress, sadness, pain, and worry, just like we have for GDP. So just the way that leaders, um, the way that we report this on at least a quarterly basis for almost every single country in the world, what if we did that for how people felt? If we did that, I think we'd honest to God change the world because I think leaders would be would obsess about it just like they do on economic conditions. And the other thing is, is that we'd have it at every locale for the world. Um, I think we call these um, the national unit nuts one and nuts two, those sort of territorial representations, things like states or locales where we could compare Uttar Pradesh to California and get better understandings of where we're making impressive gains on reducing stress and sadness in one particular area so the rest of the world can uh, address it. I think that's what, what would be ideal. And one of the things that I wanted to stress, because is it the government's responsibility to make people happy? I don't know that we're there to necessarily answer that question, because I think a lot of times there is an onus on the individual in order to address some of the issues in their own lives. The government doesn't necessarily exist to make us all have perfect lives. But one of the things that we're most inspired by is what Danny Kahneman said, which is to reduce global misery. And these indicators on anger, stress, sadness, physical pain and worry, I think best capture the misery that exists in the world and it's heading in the wrong direction. So what would be great is if leaders joined hands on this and said, let's curb the global rise of unhappiness, not unlike they curbed the global rise uh, or at least attempted to do on COVID. Um, United Nations, I, 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 I want to just ask, is it an effective body still? You mentioned it a couple of times in the book in terms of the indicators, um, you know, wh who's going to organize these global leaders? I mean, I, I think that's the question that, that we struggle with here at the doorstep. You know, how can we get the globe into local, right? Because that's what we're, the connect we're trying to make. I don't know that I'm the right person to answer whether or not uh, the United Nations is still an effective body. Obviously, at Gallup, we uh, we're apolitical. We don't want to take any you know kind of positions. But I do think that the United Nations did positively was to align the world on the human development goals. Yeah. And I think as we are thinking toward the future, that rather than relegate the voice of the people. 
um, to sort of a secondary contribution to the SDGs is to elevate the voice of the people and ultimately either add an indicator um, or add some kind of variable that says, let's monitor whether or not people have a lot of anger or stress and make that um, an official goal or indicator within the future goals. Um, and if we do, I think world leaders everywhere will pay far more attention to it. Mm. Um, are you doing your 2022 survey now or wh where is the... That's the right. That's right. So when we conduct a survey, we effectively work with five to 6,000 interviewers wow. who are walking the planet in order to help us capture this data. Um, and then, of course, we are conducting phone calls into 40 of the other countries. Um, and we're trying to wrap it up now. There are some places where it's more difficult for us to collect information um, places like Ukraine have been difficult. We pivoted our methodology. So we've done phone calls and we just released and came out of the field of what we've learned in Ukraine. And we hope that lifting the voice of Ukrainians is something that leaders everywhere would want to pay attention to. We are also hoping that we can get surveys completed in Russia um, because giving Russians a voice is critical right now to understand what Russians uh, are thinking and feeling at this particular moment. Um, and the same is true everywhere. Of course, we continue to try to get information in Myanmar. We haven't stopped collecting information in Myanmar, um, and we're trying to do that successfully now. The same is true in Ethiopia. Um, it may be a bit difficult for us to get into the Tigray region, but we're going to do whatever we can. And as I mentioned, historically, when we have seen challenges, like when the Ebola virus broke out in Liberia in 2014, we pivoted our method methodology and went from face-to-face -to, -face to um, and in fact, because Liberia does English, uh, the national language is English, uh, we were able to just successfully call from Gallup's call centers here in the United States. So we're always looking away, looking to ways, even if it's not the most ideal methodology, to make sure that people are helping be heard all over the planet. Um, I love this so much as a journalist. Um, it is my my supreme joy in life to hear from people and to share their stories. Um, the book is Blind Spot, The Global Rise of Unhappiness and How Leaders Missed It. Put it in your holiday stocking. Give it as a birthday present. Uh, this book needs to be read far and wide. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. Um, I really appreciate it. Tatiana and Nick, thank you for having me. And thank you for... Uh, reading the book, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you.